been looking forward to this one. You'll understand why in a second. Formula One, the legends, cult drivers and their legacies is the new book by Tony Dodgins, who celebrate, which celebrates Formula One's most iconic drivers with its exploration of their triumphs and tragedies, featuring brilliant photography and insight from renowned Formula One journalist Tony Dodgins. We had him on the show, gosh, it must have been about two or three years ago, about the rivals. Great to have you back on. Great to welcome him back on. Uh, Tony Dodgins, afternoon to you, Tony. Yeah, good to see you again. So here we here we go again. Well, Formula One now has changed so much from the first World Championship in 19, 1950. How on earth do you put together a list of 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 uh, legendary drivers? Is it the adoration of the public? Is it how many they won? Because if you just go by stats, of course we now have what. 20,000 Grand Prix a year, so of course people are going to go yeah, top it. It's, it's crazy, yeah. It's, it's actually harder to work out who to leave out than it is to put in, actually, because, you know, there was a there was a set amount of words, set amount of space, and uh, you end up leaving people who've been world champions out, you know? So, uh, for instance, you know, people like Jody Schechter, who was a, a sort of quite extraordinary individual, achieved lots of things outside Formula One, was world champion, yet he doesn't make the, doesn't make the cut kind of thing, you know? So it's actually, that was the hardest part, trying to work out who to leave out rather than who to put in and it's not just about the champions is it it's not about it's not about the, the people who who was it i mean you got villeneuve in there i mean Gilles. and and if you if you were a, if you were a, a schoolboy uh, f1 fan in the 70s i mean villeneuve was basically everything you wanted him to be Absolutely. For instance, you know, you've got him in and Jacques, who was the world champion, not in. So uh, Gilles was just one of those charismatic guys. You know, he, he drove he drove the wheels off everything. He, he drove things with wheels hanging off, you know, three wheels at Zanvoort and all that kind of thing. And, and he was just the, and I think, you know, he's renowned as one of Enzo Ferrari's, you know, f- you know, most legendary favourite drivers. What is it, do you think, that gives certain drivers a charisma like like a, a, a Villeneuve, uh, like other people we have in the book, for example, Jackie Stewart was a superstar. Uh, and and, and in, a, in a world where we now are used to seeing Verstappen everywhere, we have to remember, A, the fact that Jackie Stewart was really the first marketed world champion, because you could do anything from buy T-shirts, which I had, to the glasses, but also, the, the if you're talking about uh, legends, the amazing work that he did safety-wise. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, Jackie, Jackie was the guy that got me into it as, a, as an eight-year-old. You know, it was it was him and Jock and Rint and those battles that really, you know, floated my boat. I was interested in cars. I was interested in sport. And you saw those two battling '69 British Grand Prix at Silverstone because you only got about you know three races you know in that era on the TV. You got a bit of bit of Monaco, a bit of Silverstone, and a bit of Monza, and that was it. And I saw that battle, and I was hooked. You know, been hooked for the rest of my life, kind of thing. You know. And it's interesting you mentioned you mentioned uh, Rint in there because the book and, and also Jackie because I, I, I was catch, uh, fortunate enough to catch the the Stewart documentary uh, and along with the, the triumph goes the tragedy um, uh, and obviously somebody like Jackie Stewart his whole you know his whole um, his whole career was shadowed by that and of course you've got Rint in there who was the thankfully yeah. the only posthumous world champion. Absolutely, I mean that that battle at Silverstone obviously. Uh, I became a, a Jackie fan. Like you say, you know, you had the shades and all that. I had one of the corduroy caps at nine until it was eaten by a police horse outside Roker Park, you know. <laughs> so, but obviously, you know, I'd seen that battle. I was into Jochen as well. And then that gorgeous Lotus 72 the following year in which, you know, he was killed. And, uh, you know, I remember we were supposed to be going on a sort of family outing, I think, up the Cheviot Hills. And I, I was saying, you know, can I not, can I not can give it a miss and, and go and, you know, stay at my grand's because I wanted to watch my I wanted to watch him clinch the title, you know. And I walk in there on the Saturday. My folks got off up to the, you know, up the Cheviots. And, you know, my granddad said, oh, another one has been killed this afternoon or something. And I said, oh, who, you know? And he said, oh, oh, he said, uh, Rit or something. And I said, oh, my God, you know. And that, you yeah, know, so it was, it was, it was those two really that, that, you know, really made a big impression on me when I was young. And, and you go even further back with this one because you go to the 50s and people, names like Ascari and, you know, Fangio uh, and Hawthorne, first British world champion, of course, and yeah. the greatest driver ever to win the world championship, of course, uh, Sterling Moss. Yeah, exactly. You know, so you've, you've got those legendary figures. I think, you know, you talked about Stewart as being 
the guy who was probably the, the first one that was marketed properly and everything. And, and it, it was his era as well. It was the end of the 60s, wasn't it? And, and all that kind of thing. But Sterling, uh, before that, you know, sort of a decade before that, was probably, you could say, the first professional inverted commas racing driver. Yes, because he took it, he took it very seriously, didn't he? He 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 trained properly. He regarded it as as a business, while everything else was a bit sort of playboyish. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, he he was sort of massively organised and, and had everything sorted. And and yeah, rather whereas you know before it had been a sort of uh, sort of rich men's and, and gentlemen's game, hadn't he? he was he was like a real pro. And so. We come into, we go from the sort of the 50s and there's some great photographs and because it's interesting because you, you, you look at the, you look at the cars of the 50s or you see them going around Goodwood or, or historic and you think, oh, well, you know, they're not that quick. But then you realize what the circumstances they were racing in, i.e. bombing along you know, fields with telegraph poles and buildings or whatever, or doing yeah. those long distance races. And then you realize that it, it's actually quite, you know, quite fast enough. Thank you very much. And, of course, you know, they were effectively mobile incendiary bombs, weren't they? You know, because they had these fuel tanks and, you know, they could be punctured and, you know, something hot would go through and the whole thing would go up. And, you know, it wasn't until sort of the late 80s, early 90s that we had these, you know, aircraft cell bag tanks that were protected and everything, and many which more or less did away with the threat of fire, which was, you know, the most, uh, the deadly threat they faced, I think. Indeed. So what's, when we move into, if we say the modern era, say 80s, of course it's dominated by Prost, Senna, PK, Mance, or those four. Um, yeah. And again, I mean, obviously Senna's a shoe in because it's Senna. Um, yeah. And his, and his legend has only, if you like, increased... Be, you know, since since his death, and, and and even now, if you go to a Grand Prix, you'll see Brazilian flags with center on it. Oh, absolutely! I mean, he, you know, I I think he was sensational. I did, I did a book about him, and uh, you know, I, probably the well, only judging by the people I've seen, probably definitely the you know the greatest driver I've ever seen. And Mansell. You know the yin to his yang, if you like. You know the the uh, uh, the uh, the driver who he had probably. I mean, every always remembers sort of Senna and uh, Senna and Pross, but Senna and, Senna and Mansell and, and the struggle that Mansell got to where you know to, to be an F one driver um, was is, is quite and, and the and also the the I was there in ninety one at Silverstone and the complete adoration of, of the yeah. British crowd. I mean, we'd never, I mean, we, you know, we were in the BRDC clubhouse because of dad. And it was like, well, who are these people? They should be at football matches and sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was the people's champion, wasn't he? You know, he, he, you talk about the, the, the struggle he had and everything, just mortgaging his house for four Formula three races and all that kind of thing. And then he gets there and, and he's just, uh, He's box office, isn't he? It was it was the way he attacked. I think you know the, he he was the guy you didn't want to see in your mirrors, and some of the you know the, the overtaken manoeuvres he pulled off were were, were just legendary. Yeah, and, and, and also uh, of course he was from Birmingham, and he was just like one of us. This was the other thing, wasn't it? He so you could believe that you could, in the same way that you could believe that you could score at Roker Park, you could believe that you could be Nigel Mansell. Absolutely, and he and he ended up obviously going to Ferrari as well, with which just sort of cemented it, didn't it? And and opened him up to you know the Italians loved him as well, you know. So, so uh, and um, looking at sort of the more modern era, obviously Schumacher. That's the, I'm presuming that's M, by the way, rather than R. Yeah, that's M. That's <laughs> M. <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah. Another extraordinary guy, and and uh, you know he he raised the bar again. I think with you know his levels of fitness and his levels of total you know focus on the whole thing, and he also had the uh, the other side, the slightly ruthless side that he was you know he was more or less prepared to do anything, wasn't he? And and you, you know so he polarized people's opinion, but there's no doubting his brilliance in the car. Uh, but he do things like you know Monaco. 2006 and you know crash at sort of 17 you know kph at the rascas to yeah. stop anybody going you know that all that kind of thing so and of course yeah adelaide 94 Erez 97 so uh yeah but an extraordinary driver but again it, it's, it's that because as, as senna used to say and senna got criticized of course because his tactics weren't he wasn't yeah. maybe there's been this sort of like beatification of senna because of the the circumstances of what happened but we, we, we you know a lot of people forget how i mean i wasn't a huge senna fan for a long time because he could be like that as well he could be Un, you know, if you don't go for the gap, you're not a racing driver, etc. 
yeah, no, he he was, and I think uh, if if you think back to the the eighties and and carbon cars, and rather than you know the aluminium things, I mean, obviously he started off in eighty four, and they were still aluminium chassis then, but it got safer mm. uh, quite quickly, didn't it? And you people were prepared to. Uh, risk having accidents, knowing that you could uh, you could have an impact and, and and walk away, you know, which it wasn't like that in the fifties, sixties, and even the seventies, you know. So uh, I think there's definitely a bit of that involved. And then, as you say, you know, he maybe started it, Michael carried it on, and uh, you know, in nowadays, you know, people would accuse Max of the same thing, but possibly to a lesser extent, but you know, definitely a ruthlessness in the in the driving. It's interesting we talked about 97, the European Grand Prix at Jerez, because I was there as well, and that marks the, the first victory of a, of a, a, a young, um, a young Hakkinen, of course. Yeah, indeed. And uh, he, he didn't do that. Mika was uh, very correct on the circuit, and, and sort of, uh, I think a lot of his, his, his competitors acknowledged that. And said, you know, you knew where you were with him, and you know he was a hard racer, but he, you know he wouldn't do anything that was questionable. And also, but this, he, you know, he inherits that long line of Finnish car control because of the rallying and all those flying fins of the sixties and the seventies. But you've got to yeah. have, if you're going to have somebody like like Schumacher taking all the headlines, you've got to have the foil, haven't you? You've got to have the other guy because otherwise, we, you get a Verstappen like procession. And yeah, and it, I don't. If you're a racing fan. Um, if you're not a racing fan, then the name Zonta probably means nothing to you. But if you were Zonta in Spa in, what was it, 1999 or whatever it was. Yeah, got, on either side of him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Schumacher on one side, Hakkinen on the other, and, and one of the greatest yeah. overtakes of all time. And that was pure box office. That was. And that, that was Mika being very annoyed about having been ruthlessly chopped the lap before. And uh, he thought, right, you know, it was that was an aircraft crash if they, you know, if they basically, you know, gone wheel over wheel. And the next lap, he just thought, I'm having him. And, and you know, he went, <laughs> he went down two wheels on the grass and, that, and fantastic manoeuvre. And then afterwards, he saw them. He was just very calmly explaining to Michael you know, he, he was going through the positions with his hands of the cars. It wasn't raising his voice, wasn't waving his arms around, but, you know, he just sort of explained to him very, very precisely that was out of order. And uh, I think Michael accepted it. And, and, you know, they were, they had a lot of respect for each other. Because they'd known each other going up to his foot for the Formula. And then they raced, at, there's a great picture of them. I think it's a Macau or Pau in, in, in Formula. Yeah. Macau, you know. yeah. yeah. Michael off, yeah. Exactly. So they'd had history. And another Finn, and, and again, talking about charisma, or just one of his own, uh, uh, of course, Kimmy, you know, the Iceman, who's just, yeah. you know, it's a shame he's gone, um, but he, he, an absolute law unto himself. Yeah, he was. He just, uh, I think, he, you know, from from what I gather, people who knew him well, who were really, you know, close friends with him, other drivers and what have you. So he was completely different, you know, in, in private, would he let his hair down, which was quite often, you know. And, uh, you know, he, he could be the life and soul of a party, but he just didn't, he didn't want to engage. I think he probably knew that to engage made his life harder, you know, because he would have there be more demands of him and all the rest of it. So he was sort of monosyllabic and, and, that, and that was it, you know. <laughs> but he, he was funny, he just told it like it was, but, but just with very, very few words. Well, yeah, exactly. He didn't, he didn't actually do the whole sort of media circus thing, did he? Now, I have to mention, because I'm yeah. sitting in a studio in Spain, and mm -hmm. prior to a certain young man getting a Minardi test drive, and I've got a friend of mine who, uh, who, uh, who was on the same F1 Minardi test. And you know, the, he came in and he said, you know, you, you're, you're basically a second slower than Fernando. Why? And he just said, because this kid is effing quick. And Fernando yeah. Alonso, from, from Spain, not having a great history of F1 drivers, just absolutely turned turned the sport around uh, in Spain and continues to do so. I know exactly what you're talking about because we used to go there and we used to drive in. There was one man and his dog in Barcelona, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, the place is round. It always used to just be about, uh, you know, it was it was Barcelona, Real Madrid, and then motorcycle racing, wasn't it, for the Spanish? Basically, yeah. All all of a sudden the place is rammed and you can't move and he's, you know, the national hero. And I, I think he's, I think he's massively, uh, he's right up there amongst the, the, the very best. He should, for my, for my money, have five, at least five world titles to his name. And also across, I mean, he's done Dakar, you know, he's done the Dakar, he's done, you know, the Le Mans, he's done, he's done Indy. I mean, he's had, 
I mean, that, it's a, it's, he's a throwback to the old school, and there he is. And, and obviously, we, we being at the prime of life, can only look back. And when they say to people, people, the people are veterans at, uh, at forty, whatever he is now, but just absolutely showing his racecraft and and still his strength and, and speed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he's a you know he's a very fit guy. He cycles a lot and, and all of that. And uh, I think with the you know the modern approach they've got to diet and training and all of that, he, there's no reason why he you know. He, he can't be challenging for, for world titles in 44, 45. I don't see why not. There was a picture, somebody put up a meme, or whatever the kids call it, about, you know, the future of F1. And it was, you know, there were pictures of all the young drivers, you know, Spisario, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was a picture of Alonso because he's still obviously going to be, be there or thereabouts. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'd love to see him challenging for, for a world title because I'm sure he can. He just needs the car, you know? So... Let's let's talk about the max factor, and I'm not going to get involved with the whole thing. You know, the, the fun and games we're having at the beginning of this season. You have to to be a Formula One driver is is an incredible amalgamation of talent, skill, business, and everything else. And and they're saying, oh well, he's only winning because he's got the best car. But I think we have to agree at this point. But you could probably put a talent like that, which he is, in a car, and he would be he would be competing pretty near the front, even if he wasn't in the all-conquering Red Bull at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think he would, from the people I've seen, he's probably the closest to Senna, I would say, in terms of natural ability and, and, and pure speed. And the amount he out-qualifies teammates by and all this kind of thing, using that as a metric. But I think you're right. I think the car is massively important and... You know, you couldn't put him in a car that's a second off the pace and have him win races. He wouldn't be doing that. But if you put him in a car that was two tenths off the pace, he'd probably make the difference. Uh, yeah, and, you know, if you're looking at Red Bull as well, and also, you know, what, what, I mean, they used to call themselves Toro Rosso when I remember. I mean, they were brutal with their drivers. You get they get into F1 and they'd be gone in in four or five races. So it's not just the car. You've got to be able to handle the pressure, and he's put. Chico Perez, who's a good driver in the shade, I don't think Ricardo would want to get into a car with him again, next to him again, because he just makes good drivers look 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 ordinary. Well, Daniel did all right against him in the first, you know, in the first year, and even the second. But by the third year, Max was. I mean, initially over a lap, Daniel was slightly quicker, but Max turned that round so quickly. And I think that's what, you know, spooked Daniel. He just thought, I don't know whether it was, you know, he was aware that his, his market value would be hugely punctured if he stayed where he was. And there was a nice fat offer on the table for Renault. But I think it was a case of, I've got to get out of there. Mm. You know, it, it, the kid is too good. And also, but he's also done, Max, what all the great drivers do, which Senna did, which, which Schumacher absolutely did. He's built the team around him. There is, he is the number one driver. It's not a case of, I want to see my, you know, because we remember Vettel and, and, um, and Ricardo having their big, uh, no, sorry, Vettel and Weber having their big, uh, crash, uh, through that whole season. And that's the last thing you want to see. So he's, Vettel, uh, sorry, uh, Verstappen, like, um, like, to a certain extent, Stewart, and but definitely uh, people like Prost or um, Senna built those teams around them as number one drivers. Yeah, he's, he's one of those guys that, you know, the stopwatch tells the story. And, uh, you know, a guy like that comes into a team and he's number one driver very quickly because uh, they all gravitate around the, the guy who's going to win the races for them. And uh, who, who you could put in there that would, I mean, the, the team wouldn't do it because the, the team's seen the history, what happens when you get two balls in one field. And they, you know, they, a Checo Perez is fine if you've got a, if you've got an RB20 that's, you know, half a second better than the rest of the field. That's all you need. Mm. But what would be interesting is when Hamilton goes to Ferrari, if the Ferrari is close, you've suddenly got Hamilton and Leclerc, you know, both real top liners in a Ferrari. But you see, last, so, yeah, but you yeah. see, the problem is that last time I, last time I was at Jerez, which was for a GP3, I think, and there was a certain yeah. Red Bull driver, uh, and his name was, uh, was Carlos Sainz Jr., yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Carlos, to be fair, did a, a reasonable job at Toro Rosso alongside Max in 2015. Mm. Mm. But, you know, it, but that was getting a bit spiky, I think, with the two dads and all the rest of it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. it would be interesting to see what happens there. I, I, I could, I could see that, but you know, 
whether whether they go for that or whether Carlos Sainz you know, Jr. is from Madrid. We've got a nice shiny new street circuit, which I can't stand. Coming up, Carlos Sainz Sr. Yeah. was the biggest name in the motorsport because of his his incredible pedigree before that with the rallies in the nineties. It, it, you know, it's a marketing man's. I mean, it might be a, it might be a team principal's nightmare, but it's a marketing man's dream, and it will absolutely bring all the, you know, the, the Real Madrid color sign supporting so and so to the to the barriers. It'll be massively interesting, actually, to see how how that would go. Because I mean, obviously, you know, I rate Leclerc very highly, but people were saying, oh, you know, he'll blow he'll blow signs off, and 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 he is quicker, but. There's no way that science was ever just going to sit there and you know accept number two status because you know his dad's Carlos Science Syria and his his role models Rafa Nadal so there's no guy no way he sits there and says I'm second best. Isn't he? So when it comes to, to actually you know putting laying this out, I mean photography wonderful but it must be quite difficult for you to, to sort of compress these various careers into into chunks that both aficionados and somebody just casually can can get an understanding for yeah I, <laughs> you're right i hope i've halfway managed it but uh, yes yeah it is a case of that you could probably you know you could write a book on any of them pretty much you know they're also they're a lot they're fascinating characters and their different styles and, 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 you know, the excitement level. But it's all about the personality, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, I, I could have, uh, you're right, I could have written uh, probably ten times as much on each one. The book is called Formula One, The Legends, Cult Drivers and Their Legacies. It's by Tony Dodgins, who we're speaking to today. Uh, you've done this sort of thing before, Tony, because we'll back, we're back on again. If people want to find you, uh, where can they find you online? Say, say again? If people want to find you, where can they find you online? I haven't got a very good online presence oh, okay. to be fair. <laughs> well, that's, that's probably good then. But you can we be able to you can download the you can order the book from our own virtual bookstore as well, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do do that, and and uh, I, I, yeah, they might find me on Twitter, but I don't think I've done a tweet for God knows how long. So uh, not uh, not the greatest way to uh, to sell online. I should uh, I should have a bigger presence. You have a, right. we'll, we'll we'll talk after that, and we'll we'll see what we can do about that one. This book is called Formula One: The Legends, Cult Drivers, and Legacies. And yes, it's got James Hunt in it. Before you start phoning up from Southern Spain, um, cult drivers and the legends and their legacies. There's a thought. Um, it's by Tony Dodgins, who is speaking today. Tony, thank you so much for your time today. No, good to talk to you. Thanks very much, Charles. Cheers.